So uh, welcome everyone to the uh, online Horvitz seminar. And uh, today we're very happy to have uh, Thierry Baudinot from uh, Ecole Polytechnique uh, telling us about fluctuating Boltzmann equation and large deviations for a hard sphere gas. Thank you, thank you very much so it's, uh, for the invitation. And um, I want to uh, talk about uh, joint work. Uh, I've been uh, doing uh, with uh, Isabelle Gallagher uh, Laure Saint-Raymond and uh, Sergio Simonella on the, uh, the problem of the dynamics of uh, hard spheres. So what is, um, what is the topic of, uh, of this talk? So basically we, we're going to study uh, a system, a microscopic dynamics coming from uh, a Newtonian uh, dynamics, purely deterministic. Uh, and I would like to, to understand uh, how uh, it can be uh, summarize somehow in the, kin in the kinetic limit uh, to a single equation, the Boltzmann equation, which is a kind of mesoscopic uh, description. And one of the um, interesting feature of this limit uh, is that uh, on the one hand, one has a Hamiltonian system, uh, purely deterministic, uh, and on the other hand, one can view this Boltzmann equation as a kind of stochastic description of the system, and it turns out that this uh, equation is dissipative, uh, is irreversible, uh, and we would like to understand how uh, these two sides of, um, uh, on, on this picture can be connected. And the, the, the question are, are the following. Uh, first of all, uh, can we say something on the finer scale? Can we can we describe better the system beyond Boltzmann equation? Uh, uh, because uh, this uh, kinetic limit uh, gives only a kind of average. Uh, and the, the second point of this talk will be, can we say something on the irreversibility and the microscopic correlation? And both, of course, uh, issues are, are linked. So uh, the, the talk will be uh, made of a, a few parts. First of all, I will tell you or explain what is this deterministic microscopic dynamics. I will review uh, many works uh, already done on the convergence to the Boltzmann equation. Uh, and then I will talk about this fluctuation, the relation to cumulants and the large deviations. So uh, we, we're going to start uh, with a, a gas. Uh, uh, with hard sphere, uh, and uh, these hard sphere are within a box uh, here of size uh, one. Uh, uh, the dimension is d larger than two, uh, and uh, each of these uh, um, balls uh, uh, will have a radius uh, epsilon, a diameter epsilon. So we have actually a huge collection with n particles, uh, and each of these particles has a position xi, velocity vi, uh, and this evolves uh, as a kind of billiard. As soon as two particles uh, touch each other, they collide, they bounce back, uh, and uh, we, we get a very uh, unstable uh, type of microscopic dynamics. Um, we are going to uh, use a very specific uh, scaling known as the Boltzmann Grad scaling, uh, which says that the number, total number of particles uh, is related to the radius epsilon by the following relation, n epsilon d minus one is equal to one. So of course, all this will hold only in dimension larger than two. And what is this scaling? Let me uh, briefly explain uh, how one can understand it. And basically, if one looks just at one single ball uh, of, uh, it's actually epsilon is a diameter, um, of uh, diameter epsilon, and this ball is going to cover uh, a tube if it goes in straight line uh, for a time t and with a velocity v, uh, and it's going to, to cover a very long tube, uh, which is very thin, and its uh, surface uh, here of the cylinder is of order epsilon d minus one. So in a sense, uh, if I look at this single ball and I, I look at the um, volume uh, which is occupied, uh, if it goes in straight line, uh, for a typical particle, uh, uh, let's say with velocity one of order one during a time one, uh, this long tube will be of volume epsilon d minus one. And we would like to say basically that 
this particle will have only one collision during this unit time, uh, and therefore uh, one has to equilibrate the possibility of another among the other n particles uh, uh, will collide, uh, and this leads uh, to uh, the relation that n epsilon d minus one should be equal to one. So this is uh, a very dilute sca scaling. Uh, the, the particle will almost never see each other except on average once per unit time. So this is the reason of uh, the, the Boltzmann grad scaling. So uh, let's, uh, let's see now uh, the, the dynamics. How, how does it go? So let me remind you that we have a collection at any time, Zn, a collection of particles with velocities and position. And the, the derivative of the position is simply the velocity. The derivative of the velocity is zero in the sense that the particle moves in straight line, goes straight ahead, uh, except when there is a collision. And as soon as two particles collide, uh, then we see that this xi, xj are going to collide with velocity vi, vj, and are going out of the collision with some velocity v prime, v prime j. And the, the, let's say the, the typical relation, of course, the, these uh, velocities are, are prescribed and we would like to, to, to know that essentially they conserve momentum and, and energy, it's just elastic collision. So in this way, if initially one starts with a distribution, let me call it Wn at time zero for the n particles, uh, this distribution will evolve uh, by this deterministic dynamics along Liouville equation, which basically is only a transport equation. Every particle moves in straight line. And of course, that the difficulty, uh, there is specular reflection uh, when they touch the boundary of the domain, namely as soon as two particles uh, are next to each other. So it, it, it's just a, a big billiard. Uh, we have uh, particles moving in straight line, bouncing against each other, except that we have uh, 10 to the power 23 particles, so quite a, quite a few. Initially, we would like to start uh, from um, data which is as uncorrelated as possible. So let's say that every single particle uh, will be distributed according to some uh, density F0 and we would like to have a kind of independent initial density. Therefore, we have a product of this uh, distribution. So it's not quite a product because uh, our particles are not allowed to overlap. The, the particles are hard sphere, and we have therefore to, to add a condition that none of these particles initially can uh, overlap. They have to be at distance at least epsilon. This prefactor is just to get uh, probability measure. In fact, uh, we, we are going to add a little twist to that. It's not so important for this talk. It's very important for the computation. Uh, we want also to, to have n uh, random. So we, we won't start with a prescribed n. We, we want to have uh, n uh, random number. And what will be important now is the mean of uh, n. Uh, and this mean of n has indeed to satisfy the Boltzmann grad scaling. So it's exactly the, the same as before. And um, the, the fact that uh, you, you can view this as a technical point, uh, but it's, it's a useful one. So mu epsilon will be the uh, average number of, of particles. Now, um, we have a huge collection of particles. And what we're interested in is simply the typical behavior. So uh, let's call F1 uh, Tz1 is uh, the typical density of a particle at time t. So of course I've chosen Z1, but all this system is exchangeable particles. So Z1 is any particles. And um, if, if I have a good understanding of F1, and in particular, if I can show that when epsilon goes to zero, which means also that the the number of particles goes to infinity with this Boltzmann grad scaling. If one can show that the typical density converges to some function, which is a, a density uh, FTZ1, then I will uh, be able to, to say something on my particle system. So just to, to, to spoil the, the, 
the, the next slide, so FTZ1 will be uh, the solution of Boltzmann equation. So we actually want to, to define, of course, the density of a typical, a typical density of one particle, but we are also going to use Fk epsilon, which is the typical density of k particle at position uh, Z1, Zk. So Zk means just a collection of these k particles. And uh, let's see what we can say <clears throat> about the typical density of one particle. So, so far we know only one thing. We know the dynamics uh, I've described at the level of these n particles. Uh, and let's see what's happened to, to one particle. Basically, this single particle is going to move in straight line until uh, there will be some collision with another particle. So, uh, I will denote uh, this collision uh, by um, the fact that the density of two particles uh, uh, has been modified by some collision operators. And this collision operator looks um, a bit scary at the first sight, but let's, uh, let's see what, uh, how to interpret it. Basically, we have this particle X1, uh, it's going to receive, uh, let's say it's moving at v velocity V1, uh, and maybe it will encounter another particle X2 exactly uh, positioned at, uh, uh, at distance X1 plus epsilon mu, where, which means that X2 is right here in contact with the first particle. Uh, and therefore, uh, these two, this, um, two particles will change direction. So we will see that the, the, the number of particles or the, the probability that there was a particle V1 at position X1, V1 will drop because of this potential collision with another one. And on the other hand, uh, there will be two outgoing particles with velocity V1 prime and V2 prime, which can be seen as a, some a gain factor, okay? So there are two terms here, which are the cross section and uh, I won't comment. But what should we, um, what should we uh, remember from this uh, from this uh, slide, so the operator as such, we can forget about it for a while, uh, um, is that um, there is a transport part uh, and the collision occurs uh, in a very, very uh, specific situation when two particles touch each other. So the, the collision occurs on a surface of, which is of order epsilon d minus one with potentially uh, n minus one other particles. So that's, that's what we know. For, um, if we want to, to understand the evolution of one particle, uh, we have to understand actually the, or the, the density, the joint density for two particles in order to, to control the collisions. Um, on the other hand, and if we, if we follow what Boltzmann suggests, uh, Boltzmann said, well, the system is extremely diluted. There's absolutely no correlation, almost no correlation initially. Uh, then there should be no correlation at time t, and therefore uh, uh, we should have um, factorization of this density F2. So the, the particle X1 and the particle X2 will essentially uh, have the same density, and it should be given by the product measure. And if we believe uh, this statement, and that the whole point of, uh, of the derivation, of course, of Boltzmann equation, then this complicated operator uh, factorizes and we get Boltzmann equation. So essentially, under this uh, assumption, uh, uh, we see that this equation can be closed and F1 uh, will be almost uh, uh, given by the solution of Boltzmann equation and in the limit epsilon goes to zero, it should be Boltzmann equation. So that's, uh, that's already the claim which was uh, made by Boltzmann in uh, 1872 uh, uh, based on this uh, molecular chaos assumption. Of course, there, there were some um, uh, uh, people uh, contradicting this because, uh, and the main reason is that on the one hand, one has some Newtonian dynamics which is irreversible, the limit uh, satisfies the H theorem, there's dissipation, so it's not quite clear how one can connect these two by, uh, by this claim. And, um, and the, the, one of the issues I want to, to stress is uh, 
what can we say uh, during this talk, what can we say about the correlation, which is really at the heart of the derivation of Boltzmann equation. So um, let me insist that uh, this uh, propagation of chaos we would like to prove uh, is not a general uh, statement. It has to hold uh, exactly when two particles are next to each other in a very specific position. So it, it's extremely singular. Uh, and, and this should be, of course, uh, relevant. So let's see. We Im imagine we, we are going to look at two particles um, and imagine that they, they are in such, such a position in such a way that within the, the, the next amount of time, they, they should collide. And therefore, um, in this case, we hope, uh, uh, or we, we, that's what Boltzmann uh, told us, that uh, F2, should be given by the product of the densities because the assumption is that they haven't seen each other before. They were essentially initially independent. So when they, just before they touch, they should be independent. However, if we look at two of the particles which now have slightly different directions and we want to know whether uh, F2 for these two particles uh, factorizes, then we can't expect the same thing uh, to hold uh, because in this case, uh, uh, the, the, the particles should have seen each other in the past. Uh, they, they must have interacted before and there's absolutely no way that in this case, uh, uh, we will have a product structure. So basically the proof of Boltzmann equation amounts to prove uh, that if you look in the forward direction, you should have a product structure or a propagation of chaos, but you have also to eliminate um, sets uh, which have essentially the same size. Because if you look backward, uh, then this set, on this side, the system cannot factorize. So let, let me very briefly um, extend this notion. So th there'll be some bad sets. Uh, uh, for the moment where we we'll say that two particles could have seen each other in the past. And more generally, let's say that we consider sets of bad sets of cap K particle where potentially they could have seen each other in the past because they were in these tubes. And let me now tell you uh, how one can phrase the convergence to the, to the Boltzmann equation. I will give references about this theorem uh, afterwards. So initially, we start from a, from a measure which is product, as or almost product. Uh, there's just some exclusion condition initially. And we are going to look at, uh, at a case where F0 is smooth, where everything is bounded. I mean, the, the softest things you can imagine. And it turns out that these assumptions are, are not only technical, they are important. And what can be shown uh, is that there is a time, T star, which is positive, uh, such that the marginal of the particle system, namely the typical marginal for one particle, converges to the solution of Boltzmann equation, which I, I wrote here. And uh, this convergence can be kind of quantified uh, in terms of uh, some rate of, uh, of convergence. And the next point is, uh, if uh, one can look at something a bit more complex than just one particle, one can actually look at several particles together, the joint distribution. Uh, and what can be shown is that the joint con distribution converges to the product of this uh, solution of Boltzmann equation, provided that these particles are not in the bad side. So they, you can't really uh, uh, give the same statement uniformly over all the positions. Some information has to be thrown. And, and this is thrown in, in this bad set. But if you accept to lose some information, then uh, you can even get some rate of, of convergence. So the, the, the rest of the talk will be uh, very much about <laughs> what did we lose? Uh, and where is this information and what can we say? But let me uh, first mention that this is not just a, a single CRM. Uh, it's actually a collection of uh, 40 works, 40 years, I guess, of, of works uh, by very many uh, people uh, starting from uh, the, the, the 
breakthrough of uh, Landford, uh, and, and then very many people have been uh, thinking about it, improving it, and certainly the, this list is by, by no means uh, exhaustive. It just gives uh, some mm, very important contribution, and, and there are many. There were also contribution in terms of quantitative convergence. Um, let me just uh, emphasize two, uh, two things. Uh, um, first of all, uh, this convergence is uh, limited to a short, uh, short amount of time. We cannot say much beyond uh, this time t star, which uh, turns out to be short and depends on the, on the initial data, but I will not uh, say more about it. Uh, um, second point is that uh, this propagation of chaos holds only for good configuration. We've thrown the bad sets. Uh, and my claim is that actually um, a lot of information on reversibility uh, is exactly right in this bad set. So the, the loss of uh, reversibility uh, is partly due to the fact that some sets have been uh, discarded. So let's, um, in order to, to go ahead, uh, let, let's try to rephrase this theorem uh, um, in a more probabilistic term. And uh, we're going to, to consider actually just the convergence of the empirical measure, which can be uh, rephrased as follow. Um, I have a test function h, I just uh, sum uh, all the h, um, h, z, i, uh, at time t, so the, take the mean of h under the empirical measure, comparing, compare it to the limit, uh, which is uh, given by Boltzmann equation, and we just want to, to show from our previous theorem that this goes to zero, which will, essentially, it's a law of large number. Uh, for this computation, I suppose that n is constant, just to, to fix the ideas, it's, it's a bit easier. So when you expand that, uh, you get essentially uh, terms which, um, which are repeated twice, and then you have cross terms, uh, uh, because the square, you have a zi and zj, which gives you a certain number of choices. Uh, and actually, since uh, all the particles are the same, if you take zi and zj, it's just uh, z1 and z2, it's exactly the same. So let's, let's see what we, what, what we obtain from that. Uh, the first term uh, means um, it is actually going to zero because I have this factor one over n, uh, and the cross terms, uh, in the cross term, there are correlations. And uh, these correlations uh, are nothing but essentially the density of two particles at position z1, z2, compared to the product of these densities. And as we've seen before, the propagation of chaos tells us that the density of two particles uh, is uh, converging to the product and the whole thing goes to, goes to zero. So that's, uh, that's the first uh, consequence uh, of our theorem can be just rephrased in terms of a law of large number. So can we, can we say something about the central limit theorem then? That's the next step. So instead of dividing by one over n, I'm going to divide by square root of n. So there, as usual, uh, we have contribution of the, uh, now you, we have contribution of the terms which are repeated, uh, and we have again the cross terms. So this term doesn't go to zero, doesn't vanish anymore. It's contribution to the standard contribution to the variance when particles are independent. And we have the cross terms. Uh, the problem with the cross terms now is that we, we, we cannot actually, uh, now this uh, n is, uh, is, or the n square in the previous slide is uh, n, uh, and this guy is actually relatively big, so we have to understand how this factor. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't always uh, disappear. So the correlation here uh, are going to matter. Uh, and this was first uh, shown by uh, Herbert Spohner, and uh, the, the decay of, uh, of correlation uh, in the case of uh, Boltzmann equation for the, the to understand the fluctuation around Boltzmann equation will, will actually matter to compute the variance. Uh, just a side remark. So now we, we are actually uh, considering uh, in our uh, theorem, we consider n, which is random. Uh, 
essentially the same computation work, except that instead of dividing by n, it's much better to divide by its expectation. There's one fluctuation less, and things can be sorted out anyway. So let's see now what, uh, what we can say. Uh, we are going to consider the fluctuation field. So namely, take a test function h, and we're going to, to look at the, the field uh, from on which I computed the variance. Um, in the previous slide. So what we want to understand is um, basically what are the corrections to the Boltzmann equation or to the conversions of Boltzmann equation and understand how this field uh, evolved in time. So uh, our, um, our result says that um, if I use exactly the same assumption as the previous theorem, namely uh, type of uh, almost uh, product initial data <clears throat> under the ground canonical distribution, very smooth initial data here, everything the same. Then there is also a time T star, uh, almost of the same order as the previous one, such that um, the fluctuation field, which is here, uh, is going to converge to a limiting field, uh, which is a generalized Einstein Ullenbeck process, where uh, L of T is a linearized Boltzmann operator, uh, and uh, this is a noise uh, which has a, a very specific uh, co covariance. So I'm going to comment this uh, limiting process in the next slide. Uh, I would like first to, to emphasize that this was already conjectured by uh, Herbert Spohn a uh, couple of years ago, I mean, maybe 20 years or 30 years ago. Uh, um, and uh, this uh, type of result has been obtained uh, by Fredun uh, reza Hanlou, uh, for a model with stochastic collisions. So our uh, contribution here is to show that for these hard sphere dynamics, uh, one can find in the limit a stochastic equation. So um, let's um, uh, briefly uh, review. So we have uh, two terms. Uh, uh, one term is the linearized uh, Boltzmann operator, uh, which uh, tells us how a small perturbation is going to evolve uh, along, uh, let's say, it's a perturbation of the dynamics of the, and uh, a new term, uh, which is a, a, a noise term. So the, the whole thing can be uh, also uh, reformulated uh, as follow. Uh, if, I, if I look at uh, zeta, uh, eight uh, against uh, the, the limiting process against a test function, so it's a distribution. Uh, it has some evolution as uh, just a, a differential a stochastic equation, uh, and the, the noise uh, has actually a, a variance which is uh, tuned uh, appropriately in order to to keep uh, the, the the different constraint of energy preservation and and momentum preservation. So it's not any variance, but it can be computed. Um, one, of course, one um, interesting feature there is that uh, if one look at the, just the limit to uh, the Boltzmann equation, one had only a deterministic term before. Now, uh, and this deterministic term be, uh, was uh, the solution of Boltzmann equation, which was dissipative. So once one does a small perturbation, uh, one recover now the linearized operator, and it has also this feature of being dissipative. Then the new, uh, the new term is a noise, uh, which uh, creates some entropy. And as I said before, uh, uh, its variance uh, is related uh, potentially to some recollision. One has to, to take into account uh, some, some recollision. So, uh, of course, at least this should be reminiscent, uh, at, at least at equilibrium, uh, of uh, type of einstein ullenbeck processes where uh, one has a relaxation uh, by some deterministic term and some noise over there. And the noise is uh, feeding the deterministic dynamics so that there is uh, always um, invariant measure. So there's always noise to compensate the dissipation of this deterministic term. And now the, the, the analogous is given by the linearized Boltzmann operator. Um, yes, so this uh, analogy with uh, this equilibrium on um, Einstein-Ullenbeck process, one dimensional, is of course the same here 
in our uh, case, should I start uh, from uh, a measure which has, uh, which is uh, the invariant measure of the system, so uh, a product of Maxwellian distribution in velocities, uh, then uh, this measure is invariant at any time. And uh, on the other hand, if one starts the system from this measure uh, and we look at the correlation of the fluctuation field at time zero with a test function h and a test function g, one gets some quantity. If one look at the fluctuation field at much larger time, uh, um, which, by the way, is, is only known, uh, and this convergence is only known um, in dimension two uh, and, and not in full generality. But if one look at the fluctuation field on a larger time, this goes to zero. So this is the dissipation of uh, the deterministic term. This is the dissipation of the linearized uh, Boltzmann operator. Huh? Um, and what uh, the noise uh, and the one way to understand uh, how uh, the noise uh, can be tuned uh, is that uh, its variance or its covariance is just there uh, to uh, compensate the dissipation and to preserve uh, this uh, invariant uh, measure uh, or the structure of the in invariant measure. So uh, if one look, the, the time correlation vanish, but the, the noise is there to uh, restore uh, this uh, invariance measure. Out of equilibrium, it's more delicate to, to really understand the, the role of the noise. So let me, um, let me come back briefly to, to the cumulants, uh, or let's say to, to the correlation between two points. So as we saw uh, before, um, this um, um, correlation between particle one and two at certain time, uh, vanishes, except if uh, uh, these two particles uh, are placed in very specific position where uh, they, they could have uh, had a, a collision. So that's, uh, um, that's not uh, difficult really to, uh, to understand. Uh, and uh, what we can show is uh, some estimates uh, um, about uh, the size of this uh, function, uh, uh, small f2. So uh, we're going to, to define the cumulant of order two, namely the correlation between these two particles as F2. And what we can show, uh, what we can show is that this cumulant uh, is actually uh, has, um, if I take its average, uh, um, it's going to zero as epsilon d minus one. And this epsilon d minus one is just, uh, can be understood just as the intersection of this the volume uh, where these two tubes are, are intersecting. And so there's some constant before. Um, if I want to go further, I have to look at other correlations uh, and the natural structure is a uh, cumulant. So of course, uh, for uh, when, when you have two particles, there's, there's not much room, then uh, three particles as a natural notion of cumulants, which I just wrote here, you don't really need to, um, and uh, more generally, one can look at uh, the extension of this notion, which is n cumulants. So the, the n cumulants uh, uh, will allow us uh, to have a, a much, much more precise notion of bad sets, uh, which I explained in the first theorem, where I say, well, we have k particles, they shouldn't see each other within tubes. The, the cumulants are going to measure precisely what is the effect of n recollisions between n particles? And this n recollision uh, boils down, at least intuitively, to intersect n of this tube. And so each time we, we gain a factor epsilon uh, d minus one, n minus one. So each of these um, recollision is going to be more and more rare. Huh? And the cumulants are, it's a, a way to track this uh, recollision. Turns out that um, we have um, also um, the, the correct bounds in terms of combinatorial bounds in the sense that uh, there's here a factorial uh, N and this will be important to, to do some uh, resummation uh, afterwards. So essentially the, the following theorem tells us that under the assumption uh, 
uh, I gave originally on the initial data, we can find the time T star essentially the same as Ranford's time, maybe half, maybe a tenth, I don't know, but of the same order, uh, such that uh, we have a, a control of uh, all the cumulants uh, on this time interval. So again, let me insist that uh, these cumulants or these recollisions are tiny. I mean, this, uh, the, it's extremely rare to have very many recollisions. However, we believe and we would like to, to understand that uh, the irreversibility is actually emerging because these recollisions have been neglected. So these tiny sets should really matter for uh, a full understanding of the, of the system. So the, um, just to summarize, actually, the, basically we have a notion of cumulants of order n, which means that n particles are going to interact and basically means that there will be n minus one recollision between these particles. Um, so how do we prove this theorem? I, I will not, uh, I will not uh, give the, the details at all, uh, but the, the strategy is, is very much based on cluster expansion. So for uh, interacting particle system at uh, equilibrium, uh, uh, cluster expansion is a very powerful tool uh, where one can um, understand how um, the partition function and more generally how the correlation uh, can be expanded in an analytical way with a very refined um, um, resummation of uh, these quantities. Uh, and what we've been doing is uh, using this type of techniques, uh, but uh, now dynamically. So well, the, the, the interaction now is based on trajectories of particles uh, uh, which uh, are interacting. Uh, um, and, um, and there is um, a type of cluster expansion in order to manage uh, these uh, trajectories. Often uh, in cluster expansion or often cluster expansion are limited to uh, <clears throat> low densities or uh, very specific uh, uh, perturbative parameters. And our um, limitation here is in the T star. So T star means essentially we cannot allow the particle to interact for a too long time because otherwise the cluster expansion would we would not be able to resum the, the particles or the series, sorry. But uh, the, the good point with the, the cluster expansion is that um, if we want now to get some refined information on the empirical measure, uh, namely, we, for example, we want to test uh, the Laplace transform of the empirical measure against uh, some test function H, uh, this, uh, in this particle system can be um, rephrased now uh, in terms of a series uh, where uh, the main coefficient uh, boils down to understand the recollision. So uh, if one has a very good understanding of uh, this uh, cumulants, uh, uh, we are going to be able to resum the series. And here that's what's uh, happening. Uh, there is a, um, uh, this Fn uh, has actually a, a decay, which uh, compensates exactly this, decay, uh, this uh, factor. Uh, and the C, it turns out to be small uh, when uh, T star is small enough. So the whole theory can be resumed for appropriate test function H. And, and all the, um, the theorem I'm going to tell you about is very much about extracting information now on from the Laplace transform uh, by using this uh, type of cumulants and uh, resummation. Um, let me insist that, of course, here to, to explain the result, it was much easier to, to take the <coughs> Laplace transform at a given time, uh, but uh, it turns out one can even uh, add uh, further information at different times and more complicated structure. Um, and therefore, there would be more complicated definition of cumulants. Um, so now, how, how can we prove uh, the convergence due to the einstein ullenbeck process? So the, the main difficulty, uh, anyway, is that we don't have some underlying stochastic process. There's no 
underlying martingale or, uh, or structure on, from which we, we can play. So each time uh, we have to work in a very indirect way. And, and this indirect way for us uh, is uh, going back to the characteristic function and, and start uh, using uh, the previous uh, series expansion I've shown you in terms of the cumulants. So this uh, series expansion is um, very well controlled uh, with uniform control on the series and in particular uh, with respect to H. So we have analyticity, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of things, therefore we, we can really play with the characteristic function uh, and what can be shown uh, is that um, the when one expands this characteristic function, only the, the cumulants of order two matter. The, the rest are much smaller due to our control. And, and in order to understand uh, now the, the convergence in law of the process, uh, one has to, uh, one, this can be reduced to understanding the limiting uh, cumulant function uh, with, by two points. And so we, we have a procedure to do that, which uh, uh, confirms uh, all, all the work which was uh, done by Herbert Spohn in a different way um, some time ago. So again, uh, this is only the process at one time. We can actually uh, have a different time uh, jointly uh, and have a similar uh, control. Uh, and there's also some work on the tightness of the process by essentially similar method of uh, really controlling finally the um, uh, feature like characteristic functions through the through the, the cumulant. So all in all, we can identify the limiting process uh, through the variance. The variance itself, uh, when one is off equilibrium, requires to understand at least one one recollision. To understand this limit, uh, there's, uh, one has to understand what is the impact of one recollision. So it's not like in Boltzmann uh, equation where one says there's no recollision, everything is independent there. One needs to, to understand at least F2, but the other cumulants are not relevant for uh, this limit. Uh, so let me conclude now with the, the last part, uh, and it's in, of course it's in the same vein. Uh, um, can we say something be beyond the fluctuation? So our, our question, uh, I would like to, to summarize that, uh, was the following. Boltzmann equation is a kind of um, stochastic description of the system because it gives uh, the interpretation that uh, the, the system in the limit behaves essentially as if there were some random collision by taking two particles nearby and exchanging their velocities with some appropriate stochastic process. So that's, that's a very natural interpretation of, of Boltzmann equation. And what we would like to understand, and this um, first uh, part on the fluctuation gave some clue, that uh, this idea of exchanging particle or randomness is really holds also at a more refined level. And we would like to go one step beyond now and say, does this stochastic structure hold uh, even if one doesn't, one goes really far from the actual solution, even if we look at something atypical. So imagine now that uh, F is a typical solution of uh, Boltzmann's equation, and I want to see what is the probability of observing something different, uh, function phi. And um, well, I want to understand that the probability of observing phi uh, is going to be very small. Uh, and what would be, of course, what is interesting is to, to quantify. I mean, it's exponentially small uh, and depends on some functional, uh, let's say, f hat. So um, this, is, this is the kind of large deviation statement we, we want to prove. Uh, um, the empirical measure uh, concentrate on phi. So that, that is this uh, even observing phi means that the, the empirical measure has to be close to, to that. So um, there were work uh, on this result and one very important work by uh, Fredun reza uh, And in some um, <clears throat> model with stochastic collisions, uh, it was able uh, to show that uh, this statement holds uh, and uh, to give uh, explicit uh, uh, large deviation functional. 
And this large deviation functional um, has been then uh, uh, extrapolated to, to the case of a hard sphere system uh, and uh, by Freddy Boucher. And here is the form of the, of the large deviation functional. So it's given by some uh, variational principle and I will not comment it. Uh, um, but um, there is uh, in this variational principle some uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, and uh, this Hamiltonian is typically the one uh, you can imagine from a stochastic process. Uh, uh, you uh, and um, this stochastic process, or the the one which was uh, considered by by Fredun, uh, would um, have the picture that essentially, when two particles are next to each other, or at least for a sufficient long amount of time, uh, there is a random process which changes their velocities, and that would be the natural structure associated with this random process. So. Within this uh, large devia deviation functional uh, f hat, uh, um, one um, or one can conjecture uh, that uh, if the system um, behaves as Boltzmann equation, and if we would like to um, extrapolate the feature given by the Boltzmann equation to very fine level, including uh, the large deviation uh, atypical event. Uh, therefore, uh, um, this uh, functional, which comes from a stochastic system or from the intuition of a stochastic system, should be also relevant, uh, even in the deterministic case. So um, the question is, of course, now, does it extend to uh, deterministic dynamics? So I will, um, I will just uh, state uh, a bit loosely uh, our result. Uh, uh, again, under the previous assumption as before, there's some uh, time, t star, uh, there is some functional f and not f at, uh, um, such that for a restricted set of observable or phi, uh, the, the probability that observing phi uh, decays as expected, like uh, minus mu epsilon uh, f of phi. So um, le let me say that, uh, okay, phi cannot be any function. And um, there is actually, as usual in large deviation principle, upper bound, lower bound. Uh, and to get that both coincide, uh, uh, we, we have to restrict and add some regularity on the type of function we want and so on. So this could be reformulated in an abstract way with a lower upper bound and tons of sets. Um, now, the, the, our connection with the previous result is the following, is that there is a subset, uh, let's say a hat, which should possibly coincide with this guy, but we don't know, uh, such that on this set of even more regular function, uh, the, the functional uh, we obtain here is coincides uh, with the one uh, conjecture from uh, stochastic dynamics. So, um, the, the outcome of the theorem is at least for a certain class of large deviations, uh, we, uh, one can actually prove uh, for these deterministic dynamics uh, that uh, the, the, the limiting functional uh, has a structure very similar uh, from the one of the stochastic model. Um, so again, uh, the, the difficulty to, to prove a, a theorem of this form uh, is that um, the dynamics is deterministic. There's absolutely no randomness. Everything is in the initial data. So if you want to prove uh, the standard uh, theorem for stochastic dynamics, what you do, you, you, you have to guess what is a good tilt of the dynamics, uh, uh, compute a kind of radonicodim derivative and hope for the best. Um, in our case, there's no way uh, we, we can even uh, tilt the dynamics. We, we had absolutely no tools to, to do that. So again, uh, we had to, to proceed in a, in a very um, um, different way and uh, indirect, I should say, way uh, in order to uh, identify this. So uh, I will just tell you there'll be two parts. One is to uh, identify this F and explain why it works. And the second part is to, to show that they both uh, coincide. Uh, let me emphasize one thing. In a sense, uh, this set R cannot be any function. So um, 
if we if we want to look at functions which are very far away from Boltzmann equation, we, this will have a cost uh, where uh, the say, uh, the time t star is reduced. So if you, I mean, the way I formulate it is that we have a given t star, but we cannot look at any uh, deviation within this time t star. One has to remain relatively close to Boltzmann equation. So again, uh, our um, our key tool uh, will be the, the Laplace transform because the Laplace transform uh, will uh, give us uh, some access uh, to the large deviation. So the Laplace transform I explained before uh, is obtained in terms of the series on the cumulants uh, and one can actually give a similar notion or uh, equivalent or different notion but equivalent notion of cumulants uh, based now on trajectories. So instead of just looking at one uh, function at one time, uh, we can look at the test function h on uh, the path uh, of uh, one particle. And uh, this Laplace transform can be uh, again um, obtained as a sum over all the, the cumulants. And the good point, of course, is that if one understands very well this Laplace transform, uh, then one has uh, a direct link to the large deviation just by uh, using Legendre transform. Um, so it, it turns out that contrary to uh, the fluctuation, now uh, the Laplace transforms uh, requires to understand not only the cumulants of order two, but all the cumulants. And meaning that in these rare events or the rare events encoded by the Laplace transformer, uh, they will involve an uh, arbitrary number of uh, recollision and which will be uh, all uh, encoded in this uh, type of, uh, of sets. So uh, this, uh, with this technology, uh, uh, we can get um, um, a notion of, of uh, limiting uh, or a notion of Laplace transform, a kind of notion of limiting even uh, Laplace transform. But the question is uh, that this will, this remains still very much uh, far huh, from uh, the, the initial conjecture and in particular from the large deviation functional f hat. One would like to, to understand how the stochastic model comes or can be linked uh, from this uh, series expansion. And so the, the next step uh, is to look much more carefully now at the Laplace transform. So uh, let me go back to, to this one. Uh, and uh, what can be shown uh, is that it converges to a limit. Uh, and this limit uh, uh, is now a functional uh, depending on time. Uh, and we can show that this limit satisfies a type of uh, hamilton jacobi equation. So we can take the derivative here uh, and see that this satisfies the hamilton jacobi equation. So uh, this equation as such is, is a bit complicated and hard to, to make sense of, uh, uh, but what, is, what should be important here um, is that in this equation, there is this term h, uh, large h, uh, uh, which uh, can be seen here, and it's, oops, and it's exactly the same term as the one we saw um, from the stochastic dynamics. So the, the whole point after is, uh, uh, to identify properly uh, the Laplace transform and the Laplace transform of the stochastic dynamics by proving that they share the same hamilton jacobi equation and proving some uniqueness of this guy within a reduced class of function. And so this is why we have only a connection on, again, on a reduced set of observables uh, because uh, this connection is made through this uh, hamilton jacobi uh, equation. But of course, the important thing is that it allows to make a connection to the stochastic models. So the, the, the actual proof, uh, let, me, uh, let me mention it. So uh, first of all, a, this function, I mean, this Laplace transform uh, leads to uh, a Hamilton-Jacobi equation of this form. And this one, we, we do not use. Uh, we, we use a, a, a different type of test function, which makes an, an Hamilton-Jacobi equation, which is easier to handle than this one without the transport term, but anyway, it's a detail. What is important uh, is uh, to connect to this limit. Uh, one basically has uh, to understand uh, uh, the limiting structure of all the cumulants. 
because all these cumulants have themselves a stochastic evolution. And this stochastic evolution is very singular because it encodes recollision. Nevertheless, that's from their stochastic evolution where we can take the derivative of this and recover uh, a type of uh, Hamilton Jacobi equation. So, um, in, just to, to, to summarize, because I guess my, my time is, uh, is almost over, the, the message uh, is the following. Uh, there is a um, very subtle microscopic structure uh, uh, in the correlation of uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, deterministic dynamics, uh, uh, which uh, can be um, understood from the cumulants. And the more precise we are on uh, the cumulants, uh, the better our understanding of um, the deterministic dynamic is. And in particular, uh, what we can show is that um, even on a very small scale, uh, fluctuation or large deviation, these deterministic dynamics behave as if it was um, driven by a, a kind of stochastic uh, system. Uh, and um, the, 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 the correlation given by the, the cumulants allows to, to unveil uh, some of uh, this feature. So there's still a, a lot of things to do. Um, and among which uh, trying to understand what's going on for long, a larger time, long time, because all these results remain limited to uh, short time uh, windows, more or less of the same order as, um, as the times which were considered for um, the convergence to the, to the Boltzmann equations. So thank you very much. Um. Thierry, thank you very much for a really wonderful talk. Um, let us uh, pass to the questions uh, stage. Anybody who has questions can unmute themselves and ask, please. Maybe I ask uh, first, I already had a question. Um, so th there is something uh, which of course you address, but uh, I wonder on a more intuitive level, uh, initially you have in a sense capital N random degrees of freedom which are the location of the uh, capital N particles and then out of that there is a full stochastic process with Brownian motion and somehow uh, infinite amount of uh, noise. So how uh, on the intuitive level can uh, such a small amount of randomness produce a full stochastic process? Somehow? The, 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 okay, uh, it, it's a lot and it's uh, a lot of randomness also because it's only in the limit when, when S n uh, goes to infinity. And the point uh, is that um, all these particles, uh, we are viewing them only in a very specific situation. We always project on the empirical measure. And yes. it turns out that um, all this, there's a lot of structure which is washed away. Um, and what remains is, is, a, is a stochastic, it's just a noise. Uh, but uh, what, what turns out um, is that um, the, the way uh, the system has been uh, projected uh, um, means that it looks uh, at least uh, at the first sight uh, as, a, as a stochastic uh, process. So there's, um, there's still a lot of noise initially. The, the main issue is trying to see how one can capture it uh, a long time. Yes, it is very impressive. This is uh, for sure. Uh, and still one other question. Uh, you, the long time dynamics is not understood, but is there a conjecture? Is it believed that in fact, uh, the convergence to the Boltzmann equation and the related statements hold uh, for a longer time, for a time of order one or uh, even more. And okay, so the, 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 the Boltzmann equation itself is not very well understood. So that's, that's part of the problem is trying to prove the convergence to a limiting system which uh, people uh, don't really know how to handle. However, what uh, would be extremely natural uh, there are some cases, uh, for example, if you, if you start from a perturbation close to some equilibrium uh, where a uh, Boltzmann equation, uh, one can make sense of it, one can prove a solution up to an infinite uh, amount of time. Uh, and therefore, in these cases, uh, 
uh, one would like to, to prove that uh, the microscopic system converges. And um, so far we, and, and I'm kind of convinced that it should be the case, uh, at least uh, for reasonable perturbation around some equilibrium. I don't know how to do it, but uh, there's, there's uh, I wouldn't bet that uh, in more general situation, the convergence hold because it's, it's a very delicate equation itself. But uh, in, in, in general, uh, I think it's, uh, it should be, uh, it should work. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions, please? Maybe I ask still a third question. Sorry, I, I had several. Um, it, so you start with the, the density F naught, and uh, you, you mentioned you made assumptions on F naught, uh, not too big. Uh, L infinity norm is good, is um, is a uh, bounded. Uh, but does it matter much? So if F naught is a the uniform distribution, does it help a uh, uniform in space and in velocity and in the angle? Okay. And so, so uh, it, it, in, in fact, um, if the, the simplest F naught you can imagine uh, is, uh, uh, sorry, maybe I should come back. Uh, it's this one, no, not quite, it's this one. So in this case, F naught would be uh, just a Maxwellian in velocity and there the, the system uh, uh, is uh, at equilibrium and uh, um, maybe would like to, to do even a very small perturbation uh, around that. Turns out that it's not so easy to use. Uh, um, and we've been able to do it, uh, for example, uh, in this case, uh, uh, only in dimension two with a very um, particular technique. And the reason uh, is the following. Uh, if you, if you look at the Boltzmann equation, let's say here it is. If you look at Boltzmann equation, you have two terms, um, a gain term and a loss term, uh, and at equilibrium, they cancel. All the types of proof uh, discussed so far are based on the fact that we are not able to understand the cancellation of the two terms, but we add a plus here instead of a minus. And therefore, even starting at equilibrium and extracting the information that you like at equilibrium is, is not easy. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, the structure, the fact that it's here, it's bounded uh, is, is a big help uh, in order to, to understand this, uh, uh, the, um, this type of equation because um, we, we are not handling it properly uh, with the, the cancellation. Okay, uh, another, uh -huh. sorry, yes, uh, another feature which uh, somehow is, is important is the smoothness. And um, it turns out like it's nothing, but uh, very often in the uh, dynamical system, uh, you have to translate some uh, initial smoothness uh, of uh, your um, density uh, uh, in order to extract regularity. So even so, they look at techni as a technical assumption, they, they have some importance. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you very much. And any other questions, please? Maybe. Hi. Uh, oh, I have a small please. question. Hi, Thierry. Uh, about the, the, the exact nature of the, 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 the noise eta. Oh, yes. Oops. Sorry. What? So, sorry. Yep. Uh, so it is. It is not. Uh, it is a Gaussian process, but it's. It's not. Uh, it's not stationary. Yes. So oh, okay. Uh, no, it's. A, it's a pain uh, in a sense. So this. Uh, this guy has a structure which is uh, white in space, white in time, uh, and it's correlated uh, with respect to the velocities, uh, and uh, this correlation uh, depends. Uh, uh, or it's it, the, the variance uh, of this guy uh, depends indeed on um, on the actual solution of the Boltzmann equation. 
So it's, it's time dependent and it corresponds to the fluctuation around the Boltzmann equation. So it, it, it will be stationary if you look at, uh, in the, at the equilibrium case. But otherwise, uh, it, it, it's, uh, the variance of this guy is encoded by the... Uh, ah, you mean it would be stationary for the speed component uh, in the... Uh, the, 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 the noise, uh, the, it will be uh, almost uh, like, uh, I mean, the standard white noise, uh, space, yes. time. Okay, the and, and then there's some correlation um, in this noise, uh, in the velocities, uh, for the mere fact that you have to, to respect the, um, the um, uh, conservation of energy, uh, of momentum, so the, the velocities will be correlated, but at least it would not be uh, the variance will not be time dependent if you are at equilibrium or if you start from a measure which is at equilibrium. But, but even, but as soon as you, you, you look at the process out of equilibrium, the, the variance of this eta will be encoded by the, uh, the density of a Boltzmann equation. Okay, and, and just uh, <laughs> a very naive question, because this eta seems to add some uh, entropy. Uh, yes. Or, uh, and to be somewhat independent of the of the linearized part, uh, so would it uh, could it be of some help to 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 extend the time of uh, of uh, of convergence of the bolts uh, in the in Lanford's argument? No. Okay. So far, we we cannot uh, we cannot use uh, we're not able to use that feature uh, to extend the time, but. Uh, it's it, just to, to, to say that the, the, a bit like the one-dimensional Einstein and Beck, uh, so the, the dissipation, uh, sorry, the dissipation and the, the damping uh, are related through the invariant measure. Okay, so here the variance of this guy uh, is, is, is related to, to the linearized uh, Boltzmann operator. So oh, yes. they, they're linked and as you say, uh, one is exactly compensating uh, uh, the other in some regime at least not not of equilibrium but at equilibrium they are exactly the they are exactly the same so one is is feeding entropy uh, and the other one is dissipating yeah. okay thank but you but so far we're not able to to use this feature it's just in the limit which pops out Thank you. And just maybe the last, well, last question, uh, what, what do you mean by entropy cascade in the last, uh, last uh, slide? In, yeah, when you, so it's something unclear, but uh, you'd like to, uh, if, if, if you look at Boltzmann equation, you see that um, the H theorem say that um, the entropy is dissipating uh, for Boltzmann equation. If you look at F log F uh, for Boltzmann equation, it dissipates. For the full system, it doesn't dissipate. So believe that uh, there should be a, a representation of this cumulants uh, which, uh, on which we should be able to extract some of this structure of uh, dissipation from one cumulant to, to the next. But uh, that, that is one of the, of the, of the things we, we're working on at the moment, but uh, we, we are not able really to follow where this dissipation of entropy goes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, usually I end the, the recording and people who would like to stay, perhaps ask more questions offline are welcome uh, to do so. So I'll uh, end uh, the recording uh, now. Um,